The Dauntless Gerald wasn't sure what he was expecting as he exited the Dauntless. Usually, the end result of blowing off steam online was getting banned from some game or another until he made a new account and did it all over again. But of course, expecting a normal, rational, and sane response in this insane galaxy was likely insanity itself now, wasn't it? He had heard of the Gravia, seen the pictures of the women, too many straight lines and perfect shapes. Honestly, the race looked like geometry homework more than anything albeit in a fashion that a lonely high school teacher would put together in a half-awake daze, then lose his next few paychecks if not his job for. Now, of course, pictures of Agravia as he's doing extra last-second research is one thing. Getting Frenched by one is another. He pushes back and she pulls away to smile, seeming to shift from a small number to an enormous amount of polygons at the same time, it was like watching the strangest tech demo in real time as she shifted from to low resolution right in front of him. The effect was ethereal and otherworldly. Her eyes were enormous and guileless. Her outfit was a single nylon dress that left her breasts halfway through, spilling out and her hips bulging at the sides. Strappy stiletto heels and big jangly bracelets and earrings complete the look of brainless but beautiful. She makes the already over-the-top and downright pornographic races of the galaxy look both conservative and understated. Okay, that was over-the-top? Oh, I know, cutie pie. Come on. Let's walk and talk. There's like a wonderful little cafe nearby that has canador dishes, meaning that you can have something with the kind of pizzas and wow that you're like used to having, you know? She says, grabbing him by the arm and dragging him off. Wait. This was supposed to be a big talkity talk about how you were just playing around and that you'd rather get to know me and blah, 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 I know. Like I totally know already. The whole paperwork bit and the certificates won't stand up in a court if that's what you're worried about, so just relax, cutie. It was all bait so you'd come out to talk. Maiden Fair gushes at him and Gerald blinks in shock. Wait, so this is... He asks as she brings him over to a hot pink convertible and all but bundles him into the passenger seat with a combination of fussing, pulling, and more than a few kisses that is slowly painting his face bright pink. She slips into her seat before starting up the vehicle, and bouncy pop music starts playing loudly over the speakers as the car floats up and then takes off. She pulls out a large pair of sunglasses with pink rims and all but dances along to the music even as she effortlessly navigates the congested city lanes with utter ease. How are you even doing this? Gerald demands as she easily bobs around the blurring traffic. There is no assisting computer program, and by all rights they should be splattered across the holes and windows. Aw, oh, there's like nothing to it. Just velocity, angle, and resistance meeting thrust, direction, and intent. Maidenfair gushes easily as she reaches into her purse with one hand and pops something into her mouth before chewing it. It's bright pink bubblegum that audibly pops as she smiles at him. The sheer difference between the utterly vapid exterior and the effortless skill she pilots the air car is nothing short of astounding before suddenly pulling out of the traffic lane and swooping down to a parking spot and then pinpoint descending into one with ease. Come on! You'll totally love this place! It's just like totes amazing! Maidenfair cheers as she jumps out of the car and Gerald stands up on shaking legs due to the sheer speed and countless near misses of the ride over. The girl is insane. Soon enough, she's dragged him into the restaurant and is sitting right across from him in a booth, just gazing at him with so much enthusiasm uh, that he can see little points of light manifesting in the air. Uh, oh me goddess, I was just about to say the same thing. What? That too. We're like totally on the same wavelength and communicating so well. What's happening? Gerald asks at the exact same time Maidenfair says it. Jinx, she says immediately after. What? You talked. Now we got a kiss. She gushes before leaning forward and giving him a peck on the lips. 
He just blinks in stunned silence, unable to form a coherent thought. Well, you two are certainly having a good time. What can I get for you? The waitress asks, bouncing up, and Gerald slowly turns to behold a snicked with an apron over casual clothing. Sure, I'd love an infused salad and he'll be having a slabber in the Canador style. In the Canador? Oh, he's a human. We've had a few come through, I need to stop assuming more than half the men that come through here are human now. I guess I'm hoping for a tret and not... Like, why are you hoping for a tret? Isn't having any man bouncing around like a good thing? Maiden Fair asks, and there's a pause as the snick taps her side with her blade arm in thought. Well, yay, but... Well, it's that there's just a sudden burst of humans, you know? Because it's not like there's more men in the galaxy or more men showing up. It's just there's a big ball of it somewhere close and only for now. This isn't going to last. Eventually, all the men going through is going to dry up and the fun ends. To make it worse, by the time I'd be able to get my cousin in so she can snag a boy this well will be drier than hot grill in the middle of the desert halfway through a drought. Not at all. I've done like all the calculations and stuff. There's a huge bunch of humans in cruel space and a lot of them are going to want to come out. Then there's the whole bit where one of their race's biggest advantages is to breed a lot, meaning that they make a lot of men too. So there's slowly going to be more and men bouncing around and just waiting for some girl to lie, sweep them up and kiss them close. Right. And speaking about my kind, I came to try and talk you out of just... Just jumping on the first half proper excuse I can have to grab onto one of you humans and have all the fun before totally going out and having a wonderful life together, Maiden Fair asks. No, I want to talk you out of it. I have a job to do. I experiment with dangerous things, Null being just one of them. You don't know me as a person. Corporal Gerald Lore, you're like a member of the informal nerd squad based on your adoration of media that was once considered fantasy and science fiction but is more related to historical fiction or a totally awesome action movie when you're out of cruel space. You've been part of at least two major assignments that are so classified that I can't find a thing about them. You're like so young that part of me wants to adopt you instead of date you at just 24 years old. You've got a pretty big family by human standards with a mother and father, two siblings, one, a sister, the other, another brother, and your grandparents passed on not too long before the Dauntless set out. Maiden Fair blurts out and Gerald's jaw drops. You spent most of your time in cruel space as part of an impromptu ninja clan for your own personal amusement under the pranking jurisdiction of Koga Daiki, and there were no less than 42 formal complaints made about you before you stopped and said you reached the magic number for mayhem. Since then, your behavior has been like spotless and you've been like the go-to expert for things that are imbued with axiom or kutha holding an energy pattern inside them. How deep into the dauntless files have you gotten into? Gerald asks in shock as he mentally reevaluates the woman. Oh, all the way, it's really neat reading, Maidenfair says before giggling. Did you know that humans are one of the races being classified as an apex? There's not many races like that around, and it's showing with who really likes you. The Canador are developing all sorts of new fetishes, and the Apuk are going totally gaga over you guys. It's really cute to see. I'm sorry, an apex? Gerald asks, trying to get control of the situation when the ditziest bimbo he's ever imagined proves herself to have his info down to the letter after she could somehow drive through literally supersonic traffic in her Barbie dream car without a hiccup. Oh, right. Silly Willie. I keep forgetting just how new and untaught you've got to be as a human. Maiden Fair says, tapping herself on the forehead and her polygons shift into low definition than high. Apex are the races that are most likely to get into a fight or use violence as an answer. They're the ones that control most wars and war-type industries. It's more about a mindset than about physical abilities. Greater Desert Nagasha, Metak, Apuk, Kanador, Snicked, and so many others are really good at getting into fights where others are much more peaceful. So why are that categorization called Apex? 
Why not the violent or the aggressive? Because they tend to be in charge. When things get really bad, you really need someone whose reflexes are in the apex to get anything done. Sure, any ditz or doll can live a nice and comfy life and go through things without anything bad happening. But the apex are the ones that are ready for things to go bad, but to go really bad. Oh, are the gravia on the list? Oh no, great for numbers, better for theory crafting and memory, awful, awful, awful in emergencies. We've all got our strengths and weaknesses and there's like nothing wrong with that. The differences help us all figure out new things. Okay then, now look, it's not that I don't appreciate an interesting conversation or being bought a meal, but we don't really know anything. I mean, but she does know him, doesn't she? She's done her freaking homework. I don't really know you. I appreciate that you want to start something with me, but I study Axiom and Null both. I don't think it would be healthy for you to stick around and... He's cut off by the slabber being put in front of him. It's a hot steak sandwich. Maiden Fair outright coos as her salad is put in front of her and she offers her thanks to the waitress as Gerald tries to think of what to do next. I got a question, Maiden Fair says, and Gerald blinks as he looks up from the food to look her in her shifting polygon eyes. If you still think you don't know, like, anything about me... What? Oh, come on! You're a researcher! It's one of your biggest jobs to pay attention and totally make things out and figure them out like that, she explains, snapping her fingers as she smiles. I think you figured out a few things about me. Like, say a few reasons why to try and stick with it. I... Gerald stops and then reconsiders literally everything that's happened since she first kissed him. The car, the drive, the explanations, and now... You've planned this whole thing out, haven't you? She giggles to herself and nods. Un, huh. I totally want a hunk of a man with a lot to talk about and a neat life but I had to do something to make you see past that silly bit of, like, totally annoying coincidence where the way we gravia act and talk and that are seen as this sign of weak minds and fingers like that. It's a consequence of the languages and that all the galaxy is more than just totally math, so we pepper in bits to show that we're not, like, totally sure, because we can't be. I think I can feel my mind physically bending. Gerald says, rubbing the side of his head, and she giggles. Oh, this is like nothing. You should see what I can do with grafing paper and a pencil. Based on the fact that you built that big ship of yours in cruel space, I'm sure I can give you working blueprints with like nothing but some number play and a good walk around it, Maiden Fair says, and Gerald's eyes go wide. Oopsie, I didn't mean to scare you. It's just that there are only so many places to put support structures in order for the superstructure to, like, hold together in the way it does. And once you have the basic shell, you can totally allocate based on resource and accommodation needs all over the place. There's like a hallway in the middle of the ship where you totally keep the gravity down and have a system to slingshot you around. Likely with those little bits of metal on your sleeve, so it's totally got to be a magnet. Oh dear, Gerald mutters as he looks at the gigantic fucking security bridge that in all likelihood is just one of very, very many that have successfully deciphered the ship even without the hack. Sorry, I try to be nice, but I get all silly will and she stands up to leave. Sorry, I'll go and Gerald grabs her by the wrist and guides her to sitting back down. While I could have gone without the scare, you've proven your point. My main argument against you doesn't really work now, does it? I know a fair amount about you, you know a lot about me, and I don't have to worry about you being an idiot, so let's keep talking. Sure. I mean you gotta see how much of a security risk I am, don't ya? That too. Two? Oh, you do like the way I'm put together. Maiden Fair gushes happily as she turns to the side to emphasize her proportions that make Silicon look natural and winks at him while sparks ignite in the air around her. Her polygon count goes so high that she looks like a distorted human, and he nearly flinches before it suddenly drops down so low 
she looks like a pattern of geometric shapes in a valley girl dress. Then it flows back into the more in-between state that's much easier on the eyes. Sorry, 